Hello and welcome to another My NTND Marriage video. I wanted to talk about the type of person who ends up with somebody on the spectrum. Although another way to ask that question is what type of person could a neurodiverse person expect to end up with? It's a fairly complicated question to answer in that it's like asking who ends up with abusers or happy marriages. There are so many factors in determining how, where, what, why and when. It's kind of like asking who's going to end up a cheater or a gambler or a drug addict or any of the other issues that people face in adulthood. And a lot of it goes back to your upbringing, obviously, and also your personality types, your tolerance levels, your understanding of others and self. There's, again, so many variables. So let's explore the concept. Word around town is that a lot of nurturing and empathic people are the types who will end up with somebody who's on the spectrum. And that may be because those types of people are more kinder and understanding, willing to give people with differences a go. But again, it could be far more broader than that because it's not that somebody on the spectrum would then only ever end up with somebody who's nurturing and empathetic. They could, for example, end up with somebody who's narcissistic or has borderline personality disorder. For the most part, anybody, neurotypical or neurodiverse, could end up with any one type of person. There's no way to say for sure that somebody on the spectrum is going to end up with somebody who's nurturing or empathetic. Or that for example, somebody who's had an, an abusive upbringing would end up with somebody on the spectrum. There's also talk about that, which is where I'm going with that, that comment. A lot of ladies in forums and such who have ended up with somebody who is neurodiverse talk about abusive upbringings. Many more of them state that they had at least one narcissistic parent. But you could still have those upbringings and end up with somebody neurotypical. So you can see that it wouldn't necessarily like one equals the other. So there's also that theory that you would have heard that people gravitate to what is familiar to them. So let's explore that as well. In my travels, in my a few decades of travels <laughs> on this earth, I have met women who didn't have abusive upbringings, who ended up with somebody abusive, or people who had abusive upbringings and then didn't end up with somebody abusive. They stopped that circle, the cycle. And of course, I've met people who had abusive upbringings who ended up with somebody abusive as well, and they did continue that cycle. Again, it really depends on personality. In the case of somebody who wasn't abused as a child and then ends up with somebody who is abusive in adulthood, there's many factors that can determine that because having a good childhood doesn't mean that you're going to feel secure or that somebody couldn't come along and chisel away at those little insecurities that you do have and then turn them into massive insecurities. There's all manner of stories out there of say a really good looking young lady or man who ends up with somebody who chisels away at their self-esteem making them feel like they're less than and that person is the only person that they can get. Whether they had an abusive upbringing or not it can still happen. And the reason I talk about that is because a lot of people say that we settle for what's familiar. So if you have a parent who hits you, 
the theory is that when you get in a relationship and somebody hits you, you say, well, this is familiar to me, so I'll settle for this. But I think it's so much more complicated than that. For a start, in most relationships, the person doesn't lead in with that. You know, if you knew that you were going to get somebody abusive, that was the first thing they said to you is, hey, I'm so and so nice to meet you and I'm abusive, you would probably run a mile, but you don't know that it's coming. And then when it happens, there's all manner of factors, aside from the fact that maybe you had an abusive upbringing, that determine if you will stay or if you won't. If you ended up with somebody who was seriously violent, that could scare you into staying. So for example, I knew a guy who had a volatile girlfriend and she would threaten to commit suicide any time he wanted to call off the relationship. So he's kind of in a bind there. He's in this situation of, I don't want to stay in the relationship because it's too abusive and volatile, but I also don't want to be responsible for her harming herself. And so then what do you do? Eventually he got to the point where he said, I can't do this anymore regardless, it's above my pay grade, see you later and now she's off to go and mess with some other poor bloke's head. So it's so much more tricky to say that somebody stays because it's familiar to them. So if we take my upbringing, for example, my parents were hitters, they were smackers. It was back in the day when it was kind of the norm to smack your children and the norm where parents would say, I'm doing this because you love, I love you. <laughs> Uh, why do I always laugh after I say something really awful? Anyway, <laughs> I had that kind of upbringing where my parents were heavy handed. However, my dad was sort of like, if something was stressing him, like he was trying to fix something and it wouldn't work, he would be irritable. And if you went up to talk to him, he would be agitated and tell you to bugger off. My mum, on the other hand, was a bit more volatile. She was always losing her temper, always grumpy, always highly strung, always stressed. She smacked, she called you names, she was just hard to be around. However, I lived with my dad and not my mum growing up in the later days after they got a divorce. And he and I were really good friends. We would watch documentaries together and then talk about them or we would read books together such as The Lost City of Atlantis and things and then we'd discuss what we'd read. So he and I had a friendship, a really good friendship. So given those parameters of couples going with what's familiar to them, I should have by rights ended up with a man who was a good friend because that's what I had with my dad. We did a lot of things together, camping and, and such. And granted, that's exactly what my partner does because I grew up camping and so I asked him if he wanted to be a camper with me and he did. Although he is similar to my mum in that he also says the put downs and things like this. But I didn't have him putting me down in the relationship and say to myself, oh, that's really familiar, I can tolerate this. When I was growing up and my mum did it, I was powerless. I'm a little kid. I'm a child, right? There's nothing I can do. I can't call her a name back. I'll get a biff over the head. I can't do anything. There is nothing that I could have done as a child that would have stopped her from being her. She needed some sort of, you know, perhaps intervention of, um, you know, mental health type. <laughs> However, when my partner started to do it, I've said this before in other videos, I didn't lay down like a dead dog. I went, uh-uh-uh, you don't talk to me that way. I deserve more respect than that. So when I went into the relationship with him, I didn't stay because it was familiar. Oh, look, uh, <laughs> I'm so used to being offended and here's this husband that I've married who offends me. Wow, so familiar, let me just settle into that. Mm -mm. I argued and badgered and said no that's not going to happen and I stood up for myself and 
I tried to teach him there are other ways. I tried all manner of different things to get him to stop that kind of behaviour. There's also that Psych 101 theory that you go for the same type of parent that you had and then you try to change your partner so that then you can somehow fix your past trauma. I don't know who invented that theory. Was it Freud? <laughs> but again, it's just not quite that cut and dry. All of us go into relationships and here's an interesting thing about masking, for example. Kind of just going to blow this theory wide open, but hear me out. All people to a degree mask. When they first meet their potential beau, they put their best foot forward. It's what we all do. We all get there and say, well, I'm going to be happy on this date and be rainbows and sunshine and show him how fun I am and how chirpy I am or how adventurous I am or how intelligent I am. We're all bringing that to the relationship to start with. And after a while, it starts to be broken down. A little bit of your true self shows here, a little bit of your true self shows there. And it's no different really from neurotypicals to neurodiverse, except that in the case of neurodiverse, they come across as normal in that, to use an analogy, if I met somebody who was in a wheelchair, I would know he's disabled, he's in a wheelchair. When I meet somebody who's on the spectrum, I don't know there's a disability. It's not seeable. It's in the mind and you can't tell, you can't see it. So in that sense, the masking is happening because they're trying to appear as normal as possible on their dates with you. Now it's not a deliberate thing, they're not sitting there trying to be cunning and trick you, it's just how it goes when you first meet somebody. So where am I going with this? When my partner did start doing things like losing his temper and having the odd sort of niggly say about a critique about who I was. It happened a little bit here and a little bit there, small to start with and you couldn't see it coming and you didn't know it was happening. And then there's sort of a big bombshell, some big random thing that he'll say that you're like, wow, ouch, where did this come from? And then we would have a confrontation about that. And so I don't consider that I stayed with him because that was familiar. So I guess I was kind of thinking that he isn't that terrible. I guess that's really where that boils down to. When we saw Counselor Terry, in the very first session we had with her, she asked me, who did you turn to when you were sad or sore or, you know, needed support as a child? And I did break down at that point in time because as she said that and I thought about it, I realised I didn't turn to anyone. It was not like I could go up to my parents and say something and they would give me a cuddle and all would be well. They didn't have those kinds of upbringings where that's what their parents did, so they didn't do that with us. They weren't comforting parents. And in the moment that she said that, I felt sad, not so much for my younger self, but for the fact that I grew up and ended up in a relationship <laughs> with somebody who I can't do that with either, I was like, damn, how did this happen? But this leads me back to the original point that I was getting at. What type of person ends up with somebody on the spectrum? For me personally, I am so used to looking after myself taking care of my mental well-being and all other aspects of self. That my husband not doing that for me is almost like water off a duck's back. There is a part of me that would have liked a little bit more depth, would have liked a little bit more caring, would have liked a little bit more sort of love and attention and things like that. 
But at the same time, I was so used to not getting it that it was neither here nor there. And to be honest, I think that's why I've survived so well and lasted as long as I have. And I didn't think about that at the time that Terry had asked that question, but when I think about it now, I think that's exactly why we are doing as well as we are. So I think that if you were going to go into a relationship with somebody on the spectrum, you really do need to have a thick skin and be very independent. You couldn't be clingy, you couldn't be needy, you couldn't be narcissistic. And it's not to say that poor NDs don't end up with those types of people. They would and they do. And that would be hard for them. <laughs> Oh, I can't imagine being neuro sorry, neurodiverse and ending up with somebody narcissistic. I mean, it's bad enough for a neurotypical, <laughs> let alone somebody who's on the spectrum who really likes their space. And narcissists are all about me, 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 here I am, look at me, you know, me, me, attention, attention. Poor Aspie would be like, what the hell? <laughs> Eek. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that would be hard. So I guess the answer to the question is not so much who ends up with who because all manner of people can end up with all manner of different people with different neuroses and such and different levels of trauma. We all have terrible childhoods to some degree but some are worse than others. But I guess the real question is who would survive well in this type of relationship and I think that somebody who is quite stoic and super, super independent would be best suited to somebody on the spectrum. And also, I think from my husband's point of view, <laughs> he's not here to actually say this, so I can ask him later. <laughs> I think that it's easier for him to be with somebody like me who's very independent as well. I don't require a lot from him with regards to my anything. <laughs> Emotional well-being, physical well-being. As I've said before, I like having him around. We both do. We like being able to sort of help each other out and do things together and stuff like this. But neither of us depend on each other. Now that's not to say if one of us passed away we wouldn't be shattered or anything like this, of course. We've built a very strong bond with each other. It's just that we can survive day to day without having those really deep connections because he's not necessarily interested in them and I'm used to going without anyway, aside from the fact that I had that really good relationship with my dad, but I can just call my dad up at any time and have a conversation with him anyway. So there are people that fill the voids that my husband doesn't fill. Anyway, so that's my theory my psych 101 theory <laughs> love to hear your thoughts let me know what you think did you have an abusive upbringing did you have narcissistic parents there's also the theory that a lot of neurodiverse people have narcissistic parents which can affect how they turn out as neurodiverse individuals and again just like neurotypicals Whatever upbringing you have as a neurodiverse will affect how you are as an adult anyway. Anyway, let me know your thoughts below. Love to hear from you. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video.